We have one of the best traders on planet Earth. Basically, you'd see a big bid and you'd get long and you'd buy more stock into the bid. And then when it would start to decrement, it'd start to print, you know, you'd hit out real quick and something. Become process oriented. Then you, yeah. you, you create a plan and then you thrive. More quickly, but you're always going to get a retest back into the moving averages. Um, and that's what I call the EMA crossback. You know, right. I, I, I don't want to pump you up too much, but I love talking <laughs> to a genius. Uh, well, uh, Welcome back, everyone. Uncle Tony here. This is another edition of the Tony's Trading Podcast. Boy, do we have a good one today. We have one of the best traders on planet Earth, Oliver Cal. <laughs> Oliver was investing champion in the U.S. 2020, and he's going to tell us all his secrets, right, Oliver? Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Tony. Um, I don't know if I'm one of the best traders on earth, but you know, I tried to hold my own. <laughs> well, I've seen some of your results, and believe me, you are one of the best traders on planet Earth, <laughs> and you're still here. So I'm still here. You're still here. So, Oliver, I everyone, you know, we have a trading community that's maybe a little different than yours. Could you tell everybody, uh, you know, how you got into investing and trading? Sure. So uh, I'll start at the top and I'll, I'll, you know, if I'm rambling, just let me know. Um, but so my dad was a market maker on the Pacific Exchange. So, uh, you know, I guess you could sort of say it was the family business. Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area and, you know, half days from school, market closed at one o'clock. If we had a half day, we'd often go into the floor and I just got to see the environment. You know, me and my brothers running around playing tag, all the guys, you know, throwing paper at us and stuff. Um, so, you know, for me, you know, that the floor was kind of what I would think about when it came to, you know, the stock market. That's like what it was. Um, but, it, you know, I didn't really have any interest in it. Um, just happened to be what my dad did. And then when I got to college, still not of any interest but then i was trying to figure out what i what i wanted to do when i when i graduated and i had a good friend of mine i played football in college and uh a friend of mine who was two years older he went to work for a firm in new york called first new york securities you know pretty right. yep. elite uh prop yep. firm definitely and, yep. and you know he started kind of sending me these books just about trading and i would read him and i'd say ah oh, you know this is pretty cool this is this is interesting um and then you know naturally i would ask my dad about it because my dad was still trading or you know kind of retired but uh, you know he still trades i feel like they never really retire um, yeah, traders never retire we're gonna do it <laughs> I, I want to click Confirm and send and then, you know, croak. So that, that would be my dream death. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I uh, so I started reading through the books and I, I just, you know, became very, very interested, you know, probably over my senior year. You know, I, I went to a pretty good school where they kind of push you down the I banking route and all that. So I, I tried to go that route, but nobody wanted me. Uh, what? So <laughs> So You're like Tom Brady, that they took you on the later rounds. What's going on? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was hoping for, but it didn't really uh, play out as I expected. Um, so then I basically, you know, had nothing going for me. I, I was going to get into like selling insurance, which I did not want to do. So I just took the money I had and I went to what I would consider to be, you know, a bucket shop, you know, right. one of these places in New York where you – you take your money, you know, five, 10 grand, you put it up and they, you know, they tell you that you can trade their capital or whatever. Oh, um, wow. But really, they, really, they just leverage you up like crazy. And uh, they taught us to trade off the level two screen against big bids and big offers. Well, I'm and, curious and about that. What leverage did you guys get with the $5,000? I mean, too much, you know, it, it, <laughs> here, 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 here's the deal though. You didn't really have any leverage, like your 5k was leveraged up, but the firm wasn't taking any, when you were, right. when you lost your 5k, you were out and there okay. was no like training or, or anything like that. They basically taught you to trade against big bids and big offers. Cause I think that's what a lot of people did, you know, kind of pre 2000, 
where you right. could really read the level two screen. And so basically you'd see a big bid and you'd get long and you'd buy more stock into the bid. And then when it would start to decrement, it'd start to print, you know, you'd hit out real quick and sometimes flip the other direction. It was all about like hot keys and right, right, stuff right, like right. that. Um, and, you know, and then they made a commission off our trade. So, so, you know, they sure. were, they were, it was, it was a great business. I mean, wow. I, I should have got into owning a prop firm versus trying to trade. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so needless to say, I, I, I didn't make any money doing that. Um, I lost my money, you know, not all of it, but I, I think, you know, by the time I'd lost that half of it, I just realized like, you know, this is stupid. You know, why am I doing this? Um, so I moved home and, and, and actually I lived in, my mother lives in Boston. So I was, I was in right. Boston at the time. Um, and then I ended up uh, getting a job at a, a hedge fund in Stanford. It was actually a bunch of guys that split off from first New York. Uh, in Connecticut? In Connecticut. Yeah. In Stanford. And they did international arbitrage. It was basically like a prop desk, but it was only like right. six, or seven guys who kind of, they started a fund on their own, but it was just kind of a way for them to to trade prop, you know, with a small group. Um, and I got to be an assistant for two guys. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one guy was definitely a risk taker, took pretty big swings. And I, I'm still buddies with him today and, and he still trades. Um, and then the other guy was like very, very conservative. I mean... You know, I would say he made money probably 70, 80 percent of the days. And, wow. OK, you know, like if he was down, if he was down like a grand, you know, you'd swear like he was down a million dollars. That sounds like me. You know, I'm I, I, I'm I with with old age, you become more conservative, you know. I, I yeah. So he was very, very conservative. He actually doesn't trade anymore. But, um, you know, I got to kind of see these two different guys, how, how they did it. And I actually got into a hole, you know, starting out. And these, this was a real firm, you know, they actually took some right. risk on me and, and, you know, they let me trade. Um, and they, you know, knew that I was trying to learn and I was going to follow them into some trades and I wasn't really going to know what was going on, um, which just was true. You know, international arbitrage was something that I had no idea about. Um, what is that, right? Who are, what yeah. Is <laughs> yeah. And so like I got to learn a lot. The arbitrage stuff didn't really resonate with me. And right. I ended up just running into this guy on Twitter by the name of Trader Florida. Um, who, Trader Florida. OK. Yeah. He's he's not active on Twitter anymore. But I mean, he kind of changed the game for me. And really, a lot of the stuff he taught me uh I was learning a lot at the time. Like he took me from not being profitable to, to being profitable actually. And it, I got out of my hole and everything, but really I didn't have a complete appreciation and understanding for all that he really taught me until years later. Cause it just, it just didn't all register with me. Right. Okay, um, but yeah. the main, yeah. The, so he taught me about chart patterns, price action, you know, but specifically volume, you know, how to read volume, understand volume, you know, how it affects price movements and really just how important it is. You know, a lot of people talk about volume, like, mm -hmm. you know, the stock should be going up on big volume right. and pulling back on light volume. And and that is true, but there's a lot of nuances to, to reading right. volume. And, and he, Trader Florida, did he just take you in as a mentor or as a student or? Well, so he, this, this guy was doing everything for free on Twitter. For I mean, free. He was, All right. yeah, he was wow. doing videos every night. And I mean, he was unbelievable. He wow, he was wow. unbelievable the way he could read the market. Uh, may, maybe the best I've, I've ever seen. Um, and well, what a great guy and a great tape reader, you know. He, he yeah, I mean, he was a true tape reader for sure. I mean, like I said, he was. I mean, he was really, really unbelievable. I wow. mean, he would call market moves, you know, a day or two in advance. And he, he just by reading the volume, like all in, all about the volume. Um, and unfortunately, the fund I was working at uh, went under um, oh. in the 2011. You know, I, I guess what was that, the taper tantrum or something. But, you know, we had guys who traded a lot of the mining stocks and Aussie dollar and stuff. And that stuff in particular got whacked. And, you know, some guys just got caught in some positions there. Um, so from there, I 
kind of said, you know, I did the prop thing on my own. Then I worked at this right. firm and things were going pretty well for me. I you actually, going up. Second, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, I had my second best day the day we were going under and, uh, you know, I was like feeling good. And then, you know, they took me to conference room and they said, Hey, go close your position. <laughs> so oh my gosh. Then, wow. Uh, you know, when you're the smallest guy, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're having a good day or not. Yeah. You're um, gone. Yep. Yep. But so from there, I, I, uh, I, I decided I need to get a job. So I kind of leveraged my college network and I got a job, uh, trading is what's called an outsource trader. And how uh, old were you when you became an outsource trader? I was probably like 24, maybe like, yeah, 24, maybe late 23, but you know, somewhere mm -hmm. in that range. All right. Uh, and basically I worked essentially for this one guy at a firm. I was his assistant and he had a book of business that he had built up, you know, over his career, you know, maybe, maybe over 15 years, he'd built this book of business and we were unique in that, you know, sales trading, do you know what sales trading is? You know, guys that hunt for order flow and they, right. You know, right. Yep. Yep. So we, we, you know, the majority of our firm was sales traders, you know, it's probably 300 of them in the New York office. I was out in wow. San Francisco. 300. In, oh my God. In, yeah. In, in San Francisco, you know, we had like 10 or 15 sales traders, but then, really we had like 10 outsource traders and essentially is what that is is like a big fund who doesn't want to hire a trader internally mm -hmm, we would mm -hmm. trade we would trade we would be their trader we would know their positions they were generally prime brokered at, at the firm and we did all their orders like everything they did we executed we called and paid the street when they wanted to pay you know goldman or whoever and try to get right, their research right. So we had all those relationships. And so I, I learned a lot um, in that I got to, you know, I, I bought this one pretty well known stock now, you know, before it was as well known. Like I, I brought, I bought 100,000 shares, 300,000 shares of that a day for, you know, months. I, I don't even wow. know how many months. So I, I got to understand kind of how bases were built right. and, then understand how there's just so many different strategies in the market. You know, I traded for a, a big fund that they ran like a conservative call right strategy. Um, and, you know, they'd be buying a lot of stock, but selling calls. So like whereas together, some, yeah. Yeah, so somebody else might be literally trading the exact same stock as them, but as like a value guy or another right. guy, some less, less momentum guys, but, um, you know, maybe one or two of them. But I got to understand, you know, there's a lot of different ways people are playing the market. Um, and this and one was in San Francisco? This yeah, this was in San Francisco. So, yeah, I lived wow. in San Francisco for eight years. After wow, so college. you went back home after the East Coast. So that's cool. Yeah, so basically I moved to Boston in high school and then mm -hmm. I went to college in Maine. And then I, you know, did a year in New York and then moved back out to San Francisco. Wow, that's great. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Um, and I was trading my own accounts the whole time. I was learning from Trader Florida this whole time. I was watching his videos every single night. I was scanning the market, looking for patterns, doing, you know, everything. Um, I would have huge runs where I'd like make, I mean, you know, <laughs> I'd make big percentage returns. I wasn't exactly like making enormous amounts of money. Um, but I was, but I was learning a lot and um, just growing my accounts. You know, over that time period, I, I grew all my accounts. What size um, was your account? If if we could ask you, uh, I mean, when I first started trading, I, I started trading with seventy five hundred dollars, uh, and actually twenty five hundred of it was my sister's, twenty five hundred okay. of it was my mother's, and twenty five hundred of it was mine. So it's not like I started trading with a with a bunch of money. You know, right. I. I didn't have any money. Um, and I just grew that, you know, over, over the years. Um, and then I did end up opening an options account where I, you know, I was rolling in the money calls on this Chinese telecom stock. And <laughs> I took an account. I, I don't remember the numbers, but you know, it was somewhere in the range of, I opened like a $10,000 account and I ran it up to like 120 grand in a couple of weeks. Wow. And then, 
Yeah. Wow. And then they were like a, a fraud. And in like 10 minutes, I lost 120 grand. Oh my uh, goodness. Oh. <laughs> which I haven't traded an option since. And that was in like 2000. 13 or something like that wow you know uh, all, all, all i do is options so we're in the, we're yeah. the different you know yeah well yeah well, when we talked the other day like i was telling you like i know you're you're a pro because uh you know a lot of young kids like i was at the time you know 10 years ago they they look at options like hey i can lever up and make a ton of money whereas a pro is generally either selling ball selling options Right. Or they're right. using it in some way to more mitigate their risk. They're, they're generally right. not using options for leverage. Um, right. But, you know, when you're 23 and you don't have a lot of money, you're... you're uh, Oliver, at 23, you have to be risking your account every day. You know, one well, of the yeah. most important skills to learn as a young guy, I try to push my kids, is to learn how to take risk. And yeah. I think trading teaches you how to, number one, Take risk, which is very important in life. If you don't take risk in life, you're never going to make it in life. And number two, it's fast decision making. And uh, people that are fast decision makers like Jeff Bezos, like Elon Musk, these people make billion dollar decisions in, in a nanosecond. You know, Mark Cuban. Uh, yeah. And uh, so your brain, the trading brain is a beautiful brain because it, it really gives you life skills that you can take beyond trading. So I applaud you for doing this. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, uh, I'm a big believer that the market is ends up being a reflection of, you know, all your strength and strengths and weaknesses, uh, right. you know, right. and how you execute, you know, when you capitulate, when you hesitate, um, whatever it may be. Um, you know, my I'll sister, you. you know, we, we and I, we both have the same dad, of course. And, you know, my dad, uh, I think I told you, he did very well for himself. Yeah. And in life, I have made, you know, 10, 20 fold what my sister has. Yeah. And the other day she told me, hey, uh, are you sure our dad left us the same amount of money? I said, yes. <laughs> but she doesn't, she doesn't take risk. She doesn't yeah. even know how to make decisions. She doesn't, you know, so... You know, even though we started at the same place, we took totally different paths because our minds right. work differently. And, uh, you know, so I, 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 I 100%, anything you're going to do in life is going to benefit you because you trade. Yeah. No, I mean, that's how it's been for me. So, um, and, I, and I would say my family is probably similar. You know, two of us are probably more risk takers and two of them are very conservative. One right. of them, we're not, we're not sure what he is. <laughs> 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 uh, we always have one of those in the family but yeah, yeah. Oliver, tell me and how you know we don't want to go deep into the investing thing but the uh, championship but how did you get interested in joining this investing championship thing sure so i had a i i'd been uh you know trading and growing my account for at that point you know probably like eight years and, you know, I'd had some setbacks too. I, I actually, like, I, I stopped trading maybe three or four years before that. And okay. I put some money in real estate, uh, which is like a, another story. And, and it, you know, it was actually a, a good move. Um, but, you know, up until the investing championship, um, I had been trading, you know, or, or prior to the real estate thing, I had been trading just like charts, price action, all, all the like kind of cliche things people talk about. But right. I wouldn't say that I had like a, a defined strategy. Okay. And then actually when I kind of <clears throat> stopped trading, um, I was still studying the market. And, uh, you know, I actually, I actually thought back to these guys who, when I originally started trading, I'm talking in that very first, like bucket shop type place. I had subscribed right. to this newsletter. It was these day traders that used the 10, 20 period exponential moving average on their intraday charts. And for me, my whole career or whatever, trading career, um, everybody who I'd learned from had used like the 10 SMA, the 20 SMA, the 50 and the 200. So that's how my charts were. But right. then I start, I just like randomly had an idea one day, you know, what if I just check out the 1020 EMA on the daily chart. Cause I had been using it on my intraday charts and I, and right. I found that it worked, you know, reasonably well. And I basically put it on my charts and I just like, 
you know, went crazy studying and um, running it on all the big winners of the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, you know, the apples, the MasterCards, the, right. just, right. you know, any of the big names, Baidu, et cetera. Um, and I realized like, wow, like this, this is like very effective um, at just kind of helping you stay on the right side of the market. And then, then I basically just dove right back in. I took all the money I had, which was, you know, a good amount more. Um, and I started trading and just refining this like legitimate strategy I had. I mean, I still used like charts, right, all, right. Volume, all that was incorporated in it, but I had more of like a baseline to work off of. And I just kind of refined it more and more every year. Um, and I was not really involved in the whole, you know, I was totally on my own. I, I wasn't really on Twitter learning from anybody anymore. I was just, you know, focusing on what I was doing. Um, and how were you making your living and your expenses during that time? Uh, so during that time, I was actually doing sales. I was selling mutual funds. Okay. Um, so I was spending a lot of time in hotels, traveling a lot which really just meant I was had a lot of time where I was studying. So uh, you, yeah, you, but you had to pay the bill somehow, right? Well, yeah. And, and actually, you know, I did pretty well, which gave me, you know, more money to, to right. put in my accounts. Um, you, you know, what I love about your journey is the journey of, of a champion or really someone who's successful. First, we get excited when we learn something new. Then we, we hit uh, a little despair because, oh, some, something can go wrong. Then we hit rock bottom. That's when you probably stop trading. Then something, I want to ask you, what got you back into it? Then we get excited again. And then your mindset, hey, I need a process. I, I you know, you, you become process oriented. Then you, yeah. you you create a plan and then you thrive. And, and people want to start something and they want to be Tiger Woods. And the first thing yeah. you said, you have to go through this cycle. And I'm, right. you're describing the cycle and I'm just, I'm mesmerized. I'm so excited because you went through the cycle successfully. Not everybody goes through the cycle right. successfully, right? Well, so yeah, I mean, I I had a, so like part of why I didn't really want to be a trader is because, you know, the reason I moved back East is, you know, I, I, I don't know if it was all trading or what it was, but, uh, you know, my dad hit some bumps in the road and I'm pretty confident it was probably partially due to the market. So I, 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 I never really had the glitz and glamour, you know, Lamborghinis, whatever people think right. they can get out of the market. I, I was always, you know, viewed the market as, you know, just kind of a, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to swear in here, but. You swear, you can like say whatever you want. It's, it's the internet. You can yeah. say whatever. Well, yeah, no, like I, I, ne I never really liked the market because I just felt like it you know, did a lot of damage to us when I was a yeah. kid. And so it was yeah. not what I wanted to get into uh, at all, actually. Um, but then once I got into it, I, I, I enjoyed it. And then really, when I was trading, I did grow my accounts, you know, quite a bit in like 13, 14 or whatever. But I was starting with a small amount of capital and it was like an easy market. Um, so, you know, I really wasn't doing anything that great in hindsight. Uh, when did you think you could live off of trading? Was it around that time? Well, really, like I had built up a good chunk and then, and then in 2020, I mean, it really took me to the next level, uh, okay. where I knew I had enough capital, like I had seven, you know, over seven figures in capital by the end right. of that. Um, and then I started 2021. You know, and I had already started or decided to go full time. I, I you know, I told my employer I'd work through March and I mm -hmm. had, like a, you know, a ridiculous start to 2021. Um, how and, nervous were you when you said, hey, I'm a trader and this is this is what I'm going to do. And this is how I'm going to support my family, my my wife, my ch kids. So I, I was pretty nervous about it just because, you know, like I said, I, I didn't have the you know, false, you know, I, I understood, I understood what it was like ha having grown up in it and seen, you know, really the absolute worst outcome that right. you know, any, anyone could have had happen to him, especially to, as a kid. Um, so actually when I, you know, I really started 2021 very strong. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
I actually took a lot of those gains and I just took them out of the market, you know, before I left my job, which, you know, was great because I, I had all this money that I could just kind of be living off of. Uh, you know, you're smart. You know, you have to take take money off the table. You know, you can't yeah. be risking everything all the time, right? So Yeah, yeah. And, and also at that point, I'd also like, you know, I'd built up some real estate and stuff. So I had right. some cash flow, which which is which is good. And I and I still now when I, you know, when I go on big runs, I like to pull money out and buy real estate. Uh, right. No, that's that's very smart. Yeah. Let me ask in 2020 that investing championship. Did you have to trade the whole year for that championship thing? Yeah, you had to trade the whole year. Um, and you know, it was just you turned in your statements every month. And you know, so I actually I traded I traded two accounts, but I, I traded them, you know, nearly identically. You know, one right. account I had in the thing that I didn't want to be taking money out of or anything, and then another account. Um, and I was you know, maybe there's some some slight differences in, in what I was doing, but, you know, pretty much the, the same is, trades. Is there a minimum amount they ask you to put in for the championship? So, I mean, the minimum is pretty low. It was like 20 grand. Okay. Um, so it's pretty much open to anybody in reality. Um, and, you know, it was a free for all uh, pretty wow. much. And wow. Coming down the home stretch, it was it was fun because there was, you know, maybe four or five of us who had kind of really separated from right. from the group. And, and you know, we were up, you know, I don't, I don't know the months and stuff anymore, but we were up like three or four hundred percent, you know, maybe maybe in like June or July or, or something like that, you know, going into the fall correction because right. we're still a correction in the COVID year that people seem to forget about. Um I, I don't forget. I mean, geez. during yeah. COVID, I had times where I was believe I was losing like a hundred grand an hour. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, forget you know, forget a day every hour, and I was thinking, hey, am I, you know, I'm I'm sacrificing my whole family's future in this thing, and it's crazy. Yeah, but it, was fun. it was fun. So yeah, I can't remember if it was like late November or sometime in december i can't remember but i had three days in a row where all three days i made more money than i made in a single year oh at, my uh, God. at my job wow and and i was and i was selling software and i was working from home and i and i worked hard you know it's not sure, you know, I was sure. trading but i'm not like a day trader so uh you know i have to watch the market but i was still doing my job and i remember once like one of those days like it happened to be a great day but i'm, I'm doing this like software demo and, you know, then I get off and I look at my account, you know, because I always like be on and then like get right off, like oh, got my laptop right next to me, you know. And I was like, oh, my God, like I, I just cannot keep working anymore because it's just right. too it's risky. Too yeah. Is. Like I actually wasn't I actually really liked my job at, at the time, but just, you know, I, I couldn't really afford to. uh <laughs> like, like you could buy the company why not <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I could buy the company definitely not but, but you know like I, I at, at some point it was kind of irresponsible to continue right. to work in reality um, and so you know then I, I just kind of went on my own I, I went out the right way I gave him like you know I let him know and like you know basically after those three days I you know I was my manager was about my age and I just said hey like here's the deal. And right. uh, so I gave him till the end of the first quarter to, you know, try to find someone or something. Um, and, and then I, you know, I went out on my own and, and, you know, it's, it's been good. 2022, I had some ups and downs, um, but oh. I made it through. And then this year has been, been, you know, great. <laughs> Would you mind sharing some of your results? So 2020, uh, if I remember correctly, you did like 900%, right? Or something. Yeah. So 2020, I did like 900%. And yep. then 2021, I I started out like insane. Like I more than doubled my account in the first six weeks of the year. Oh, wow. um, and then and then I was I was like a little bit better than a beta trader the rest of the year. I, I think I was only up like 30% the rest of the year or something. And I think bad. Mm -hmm. Like 25 or so. Yeah. Um, and then 2022, I had a monster first quarter. Uh, I can't remember exactly how much I was up. And then I actually slowly gave back my my whole first quarter. 
oh. in 2022. And then, and then I just realized, you know, this market's not any good, you know, kind of, kind of when I'd gone red and I just said, you know, screw it. And I, I hung it up and it was a great move because it allowed me to just reset. And, right. you know, right. this year, I kind of realized this year around like March-ish that we were probably entering a better market. And I was mostly trading the big caps mm -hmm. and, you know, that was the trade, there just wasn't much else going on. You know, it was Microsoft right. and Apple, you know, NVIDIA for me has been right. a big trade this year. I, I was very fortunate to catch NVIDIA. Um, you, you know, what's very exciting, you know, you trade uh, momentum, you trade uh, very aggressively. I trade counter trade and I trade, you know, and we both make money. So this is what yeah. I love about trading and investing. There's many ways to be successful. But uh, you, you really have to know, you know, your plan and execute it correctly. right? Yeah, you definitely do. And like, so that that was the big thing for me. So like the reason I entered the tournament or whatever is because I I'd been trading in the in, in the guy who won it the year before. You know, I you know, I, I, I would have beat him. I can't remember what what the what the number was or something. Um, but so I just told my wife, I actually, I kind of told her like, Hey, I think I can win this thing. And, uh, you know, if I win, you know, can I go trade full time pretty much? Um, yeah. and, uh, so, so yeah. And it, you know, I, uh, you know, the big misconception that people have is that I was, uh, you know, up like from the beginning, like, no, I was up like, you know, 5% after January, 15% after February, 25 after March or whatever. I just kind of kept my account moving. moving and, yeah. you know, there were some guys in January who were up like 100%, you know, like, and I was like, oh man, these guys are going to crush me. Right. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, shoot, this isn't really working out. Um, but, you know, I just kind of kept going. And then it, in, in, in my eyes, at least, it, it sort of became clear you know, like I said, maybe after like seven or eight months or so that there were like, you know, four to six guys or, or something who were consistently kind of moving their accounts. Um, and then, you know, I think we all know the market was very favorable into the end of the year. It was, uh, it was, it was. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I, I, I probably got lucky. I, I was fortunate to, uh, you know, sort of the way I trade is I'll, I'll, I like to, you know, try to buy some. And then if it, you know, gives me a day or two of rest, I can add more. And right. I was fortunate on a couple of volatile names to have been able to get, you know, pretty big positions on. Whereas if they just ripped and they didn't rest, you know, I might have only got like half of what I got. So I was able to catch some. Only equities, right? No, no, no derivatives or. or no, no, yeah, so it was only stock. So I only trade right. stock. Um, I do use margin, but I don't, I don't use any options or, or anything of, of right. that nature. Right. Um, and then now I do, I do trade a, a futures account, um, you know, separate of my stocks, but I only trade the indexes like, and, and really I only trade my baseline signals. So like, you know, last year I had, I had, or this year, sorry, I've had like 13 signals or something on the okay. NASDAQ. And so I've had, you know, very few trades. Like literally, I've been long the Nasdaq since ten thirty one. Um, recently, you're a happy camper, then. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, I haven't done anything except sit here, and it's worked out. Um, and Oliver, uh, I wanted to ask you if you were willing to share. You you told me you had a presentation. You're willing to share some, uh, some yeah. wisdom to the to our crowd. Yeah, so so everybody get sure. ready. I can give a high level on my strategy. So my strategy is pretty basic. Are they, can they see this, these slides now? Yes, yeah, okay. they can. We're looking at the cycle of price action. Yeah. So basically I, I call what I do, the cycle of price action. You know, it's, you'll see as I go through it, it's just like a cycle. Um, yep. I would say the easiest way to describe what I do is that I trade like an EMA crossover strategy. But in reality, I'm, I'm trading price structure. So I'm looking for like bases and breakouts of little bases. And then I'm trading the higher highs and the higher lows. Um, okay. So I'm trying it's to mainly technical. It's technical. I mean, I, yeah, mainly technical. And, 
So I'm basically trying to anticipate the changes in the in the trend. So like I'm not waiting for the moving averages to cross over like a crossover strategy. I'm anticipating. Right, right, right. Um, and so basically the way I think about it is it, it's an objective overlay to keep you on the correct side of the market. So in a green light environment, you know, a stock is above the moving averages. I'm looking for long trades. And in a red light environment, they're below the moving averages. I'm looking for short trades or mm -hmm. cash. And those uh, are the 10 and 20 EMAs? I use the 10 period and the 20 period exponential moving average. Yep. All right. Um, and really my entire career, I had never uh, really shorted stocks at all um, until 2022. And like at the beginning of 2022, I came out of the gates firing and, and, and did very well. And then, and then, you know, I got humbled. <laughs> yeah, you get humbled course. really fast on, you know, yeah. shorting, it's, it's, it's a much shorter lifespan of a trade. That's what I tell a lot of my friends because I short all the time, but I yeah. take my profits much faster on the down moves because the market, not that they manipulated, I think they manipulated up. So on the shorts, the only the only thing I have learned all these years, if you're making money shorting, take your profits and be very, very, I mean, get ready to exit. Well, yeah, you know, the old saying, the stairs up and the elevator down, right? Definitely, um, definitely. And and so but but the, the nice thing is I, I learned, I think, better how to short in 2022. And I also think I learned so much more about my actual strategy. I mean, I'm learning more about my strategy all the time, you know, how to implement it properly. Um, even, but the nice thing is I, I have a strategy and so I'm constantly just getting better at it. Um, and, but, uh, you know, can I ask you how to, I don't know if in, in your presentation, I'll talk about how you, you uh, deploy capital, what percentages and stuff. So it depends, like a name like NVIDIA or like a name like Tesla, I, I'll, I'll put as much as like 30 to 35 percent of my account in, in the name. Um, you know, not all at once. You know, I might start at like 20 to 25 percent and then maybe add another 10 to 15. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, more volatile to name, you know, I may only have like seven and a half to twelve and a half percent of my account in the name. So depending on the volatility and then also depending on where I get it, right. You know, relative right. to where I would be wrong. So, so I'm definitely taking into account, you know, how much I'm risking. Um, and some people will say, you know, I risk 50 bips a trade or whatever. I, I probably risk less than that. You know, I risk maybe like 20 to 25 bips, but Is that your, your stop, the 20 bips. Uh, no, like I'm usually taking like, you know, maybe like a one to 3% risk on my stop. So like, let's say I'm risking 1%, you know, and I have a 20% position that's 20 bips. Whereas if I'm risking 3% and, you know, maybe I have a seven and a half percent position, that's like, 22 okay. Bips. Um, okay. okay. but it's what I'm looking to do though, is then, you know, if I get some on and it starts working for me and then maybe the stock pulls back some and does what I call reconfirms. So it moves up, pulls back and it reconfirms, you know, I'm going to add more to my right. position, but then I'm also going to raise my stop. Um, so that's the key for me near the beginning of the trend. I really like to try to be able to get that add on near the beginning, you know, later in the trend, right. it's harder to do that, obviously. Um, so that's the key for me. Like sometimes the name will just rip, and everybody's excited about that. Uh, I want to be able to have it go, pull back, and then rip. <laughs> right, right. Um, that, that's a healthier uh, price action. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but so, like a more liquid name, I will, you know, take bigger positions in because I just feel very confident I can get in and out of it, you know, very easily with without a lot of slippage. And then I also like I don't take I don't trade biotechs. I don't really trade Chinese names. Um, right. You know, I like to trade the bigger, more liquid stocks. Um, so, you know, the Apples, the Amazons, the Teslas, the NVIDIAs. And then when I think the market's, you know, more favorable to kind of risk on mid small cap mm -hmm. type names, you yep. know, an example of a name I've done really well in the last, you know, six weeks is CrowdStrike. Crowd which to, to me is like a little more high octane, but it's still got like a $50 billion market cap. Um, so, you know, I, I like to trade in names 
I hate to say real companies, um, yep, but yep. No, 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 I don't want right. to, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to risk my money on Let's some, call them liquid companies. Yeah. I don't like to risk my money because like, if I lose my money, I'm out, you know, and this is, this right. is what I do. So, so I'd rather, you know, people will message me, Hey, the stock rallied, you know, like 500% like this week. And I'm like, Oh, like, congrats. Like, you know, you, you know, I, I, I say congrats, but it's like, I'm not interested in I'm that. Not, I'm not playing that game. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, if I can find a stock that rallies 20% in a month, I'm stoked. Like that's a, that's a, that's <laughs> yeah. a great return. Of course. Of course. Um, You're right. But, but wow. yeah, so like I'm, and then I'm looking to adjust my exposure and my aggressiveness mm -hmm. based on where we are in the cycle. Right. Um, so to right. kind of show you the cycle, um, uh, let's see here. Oh yeah. There okay. It is. So the cycle for me is like typically at the bottom of the cycle, there's what I call a, a reversal extension. And this is like yep. capitulation, you know, the market's selling off. People who are caught in their lungs are freaking out. They're generally selling at the low. Um, there's just a lot of volatility. And usually is what will happen is it'll snap back to the 20 EMA, which is this blue line. The blue and line, okay. So like this could be an area to get long, obviously, you know, picking the low, yep. obviously that, you know, that, that can work. Um, but it's what I find is if you do happen to get the low, like I'm, I'm not trying to get the low. I, I'm more likely if I am short to be just covering here and then stepping aside. Um, right. But if right. you do get this, I think it's smart to just kind of sell out into the initial rip back, you know, those couple of days. And yep. the reason being is I find the period between this reversal extension and the wedge pop, there's just an insane amount of volatility. So like it may come up here, but then it may come back down, you know, or it may go up and it may be perfect and you yeah. could have been able to hold it, but more yeah, often than not, everybody, everybody's yeah. going to get, everybody hurt. gets smoked. <laughs> yep. Yep. But I find if you do happen to catch this with, which I don't often, cause it's just not a focus for me. Right. Um, you're better off just stepping aside and then waiting for this volatility to contract. And it's what will happen is the price bars will contract and often it happens around the moving averages. It doesn't have to, like I'm definitely paying attention to the bars more than the moving averages. It just tends to happen around the moving averages because right. of how, how it occurs. And then this move up here, like through this little basing structure, that's really for me where I want to really get long the market. Um, and as I've gotten better with more experience, sometimes I, you know, I'm good at kind of anticipating it a little bit more. You know, I see yeah. a higher low here, it tightens and and then maybe I'm adding more here and I'm able to have a bigger position at a, at a pretty good price. Um, but that's my first area. I, I, I really want to get law in the market or whatever stock I'm trading. Uh, and then and are you taking profits or, uh, along the way or no, not really? So, so it depends. Like, let's say I own a couple different names, you know, some names I may take some profits on, whereas other, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm maybe taking those profits so that I can hold what I think is my core, core idea. Right. Uh, right. So it's, you know, it's not an exact science, unfortunately. Of course. Uh, of course. No, no, no. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second area that's the optimal spot to get long is, you'll always get a pullback into the moving average, like every single time. Like sometimes it may go further and then come back. Sometimes it may happen more quickly, but you're always going to get a retest back into the moving averages. Um, and that's what I call the EMA cross back. You know, right. I, I know why I named it that, but like you cross the EMAs and you come like back. Like the golden cross. You know, I'm not a technical trader, but you know, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not really a golden cross. I, I just kind of named it this. I, yeah. You know, it is, it's like a pullback to the movie. <laughs> average. The pullback and then a reacceleration, let's call it. Yeah. That. And then, and then you want to get long in here as tight as you can to the moving average. Sometimes okay. it's going to be the 10 days, some of the 20 day, you, you know, you just kind of got to read the stock. And one of these two areas and is where I'm more likely to try to hold the trade. Yep. Um, and then as you get later into the move, you'll have what I call just basin breaks, which are just like, you know, consolidations into the moving average, uh, ideally the 20 day, but a faster stock like the 10 day, um, but a consolidation into the 20 day is going to be a better buy area. Um, right. And often in like a solid trend, you know, nice trend, you'll have like two of these and then you'll have an exhaustion extension. Um, and so let's say I'm starting a position on a basin break. 
you know, I'm more likely to treat that as more of a swing trade where I, you know, I might right, sell, right. you know, for a couple of days. Um, whereas the stuff I get right, you know, I want to try to stick with and, and hopefully hold and, and, you know, hopefully I got on good names, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause sometimes you get a name, right. You think it's going to be great. And then it, it's just kind of an underperformer and you just got to bite the bullet and sell it and find something else. And right now, December 2023, the Nasdaq has ripped. Where, where do you see, yeah. see the Nasdaq in this chart right now? So the Nasdaq in this chart <clears throat> right now, um, I mean, we've definitely had our, our cross back. And I think we had our basin break. Yep. That, you know, about what, like two weeks ago or so. Um, so I think we've had one basin break. And, you know, I could see us maybe having another and then and then maybe having some exhaustion you know, into that. So um, you're scaring the shorts all over. <laughs> you're scaring the shorts. So that means that we, <laughs> we still have a way to go. I mean, potentially, uh, you know, like the other thing is, is we may not have a second one and, and we may not have an, an exhaustion. You know, we may just kind of run out of a momentum and have a wedge drop. So like this doesn't have to happen like this. Right, right. But you'll always have a wedge pop and a wedge drop, you know, and then everything in between can happen a little bit differently. Um, but and at, at the, the end, end, you'll have, at the end, you'll have some sort of exhaustion extension, right? which is just like, you know, euphoria, everybody's chasing the market. Uh, the people who, you know, mm -hmm. wow. were telling you never to sell down here and then ended up or never to, or to hold on forever. Then sold here, you know, now they're buying up here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. And, you know, ideally, I want to sell into this. Of course. Uh, and But that's the key. How do you know you're at the exhaustion and not going to another base, you know? Well, see, that's that's the that's the thing where I'm talking about. I've got I get like better with experience is like right. you, you don't necessarily right. know. You don't necessarily know. Um, you know, you're just trying to, you know, part of it is understanding where the indexes are. You know, there's other factors, maybe like seasonality. That you mm -hmm, can take mm -hmm. into account um or you know maybe uh i often typically each run i find i i have like one name that i just really really is kind of like my name and uh i get a lot of reads off that name now now often you know my name is more of a name like nvidia whereas right. on the current run i do own nvidia right now but it's you know i have a much smaller position i i only have like a a 12% position in it, which is small for me right. on NVIDIA. And it's because it's been a laggard. And do you so, compare uh, like the indices to your stocks and uh, to try to see where they are in the cycle? So, yeah, that's the other thing I was going to say, which I'll, which I'll get to in a second. Okay. Is it's a nice way to judge relative strength via the cycle. You know, if the indexes are like up here and your stock is like right here, your stock is probably a trap. And it's right. actually probably going to end up being a good short once the indexes pop <clears throat> out, you know. So it's a good way to judge relative strength. You want to try to be on stocks that are ahead of the indexes. You know, maybe like the best stocks when the indexes capitulate, the yeah. best stocks will be like having their wedge pop and they'll be like breaking higher. And that's oh, like wow. the ideal time to, to get involved in the market or in the best names. Right, um, right. You know, I, I trade the exactly like that, but uh, I trade the yeah, yeah. yeah, so wow, 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 yeah. wow. And so, ideally, you want to sell into the extension, but yep. if you don't sell into the extension, you know, let's say you you think your stock is going to keep going, you know, it'll come down, and and it'll and often even when I do sell into the extension, I will buy this right here a lot of the time, right, right, because I'll always buy back into the moving averages, just because, but I'll but this will be more of what I call like a wedging rally. Like okay. it'll be like light volume. It'll have no power. And you'll just kind of know, like, uh, I don't know, you know, this was an extension. This might be the wedge drop. And then sure enough, the volume will come back into it and, it, and it'll take it back down. And do you uh, put your stops below the moving averages or where, where would you place your stop after the, uh, the exhaust thing? Well, so after this exhaustion, if I were to get long in here, you know, I'm doing mm -hmm. it on, on the price bars, you know. Yep, um, yep. And if it kind of wedges up and it, it doesn't trade right, I, I'll i just get out of it. You know, I won't wait for okay. my stop um, because I'll just know, I'll have a sense of where we are. 
but yep. I'll, you know, maybe try to buy this just because I, you know, I like to be consistent, but you know, when the power is not there and understanding what, what occurred here, you know, I'll, I'll just get out of it. I won't even sure. wait for my stop. I'll just say, eh, you know, this is, this is no good. Um, wow. All right. And then, you know, the down cycle starts where you have your wedge drop, your cross back, your basin break. Um, so if you were a short trader like me, you would wait for the down cycle to start shorting. Yeah, exactly. Like I always like to trade with the trend. And then um, I'll show you in this next slide. I like to marry up. Let me, time let me do so this. Okay. The way I trade is I use like a weekly or monthly chart to see the big picture. You know, how extended is my stock? Are we breaking out of a multi-month base? you know, where are we in relation to the 10 week? So I use the 10 week and the 20 week, you know, the same right. way I use the 10 and the 20 day. Um, and typically a, a move that can be, you know, can lead to a real trend is going to occur, start, start around, you know, like the 10 or 20 week. Right. So it's not. Mm -hmm, extended. Mm -hmm. um, right. And back to this slide you know if we're in a weekly up cycle meaning like yep. we're in a weekly up cycle the stock looks good on the weekly i will probably avoid shorting a daily down cycle if that makes any sense of course um, yeah yeah I'll yeah, just yeah. Kinda, yeah i'll just get out and i'll let it reset and then when it gets you know this will bring it back down into the 10 week area and it'll kind of base out and the the daily moving averages will be going down but the weeklies will be going up Mm -hmm. And then I'll work to kind of get back on that daily up cycle. So like a stock could rally on the weeklies, you know, for six, nine months. And I might take like, you know, two or three, you know, daily trends in that move. Um, so I, so I don't want to fight the weekly. Um, but then I am trading on the daily combined with the 65 minute chart. Right. Um, so the, the weekly is the granddaddy and you have to respect that, right? Yeah, you got to respect the weekly. I would say that's something that I did not do as much when I was, uh, you know, learning. Uh, everybody's yep. focused on the daily and then the five minute chart, which I don't even look at the five minute chart anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, I analyze and manage each trade on the daily with the daily bars and moving out right. every but then I watch the price structure, you know, the higher highs and higher lows on the 65 minute. Yep, and yep. You know, something I've gotten much better at now is I used to like always like buy breakouts. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, a stock will break out and it'll pull back. And you can cool. see that more easily on the 65 minute chart. I, I use the 65 minute because it's, you know, six even bars. Right, versus right. Hour, it's like a half hour bar and six 60 minute bars. And so a lot of the time I'm actually executing on those actual pullbacks, you know, that are occurring within the daily, you know, breakout or whatever. Right. Um, right, right, right. And then, you know, I do, so I, I keep the daily, you know, five, 10, 20 period moving averages on my 65 minute charts. And then I use a 30 minute chart um, as well. And, you know, let's say, the market is coming into the five day or the 10 day on, on the 30 minute, you know, I'll uh -huh, see that uh -huh. and I'll look for like reversal bars or, you know, supportive action on the 30 minute chart. Um, and I do have, you know, uh, some strategies I use on the 10 or 15 minute, but it's, it's more like when I'm looking to play a breakout, like near the open or something like that, you right. know, I have ways I manage my risk on these lower time frames. Um, but this is like not a focus of what I do. You know, my focus is, is on the daily driven right. by the weekly executed on like the 30 or 65 minute. So right. I say here, you know, no trades are created on lower time frames. Everything's driven by the weekly and daily. Yeah. Um, and this then is the, the fine tuning, this is the fine tuning of the strategy, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so like the advantages to, to what I do are, you know, mm -hmm. it's fair, it's fairly objective. Like, you know, you see a lot of people through this whole rally right here, they're saying, Oh, like we're going into a recession or, or whatever, you know, and, <laughs> right. and I, I say, well, if we're going to go into a recession and, and the market's going to tank. Right. You know, one of my lines is uh, I've never seen a downtrend above the 10 day and I've never seen an uptrend below the 10 day. Um, so I just, I, you know, hey, the world can be ending if we're, above, if we're above the 10 day, unless we're having like a blow off top, you know, I'm not sure at the market. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, yeah. 
And then it's fractal. So like I said, you know, I can use the same strategy on the monthly, weekly, daily, 65 minute. So like literally if somebody wanted to use my strategy, but maybe they, you know, were just like much faster oriented than me, you know, maybe their, their, uh, you know, weekly time frame would be the daily right. and their execution would be the 65. And then maybe they use like a 15 minute to get in or something. So, you know, there's variations of this um but it's fractal you know price is the number one indicator so you yep. know the cycle gives me a framework to kind of analyze price and where we're at um and then i'm always buying strength i'm just adjusting my time frame to get there um so let's say i'm trying to buy a pullback on the daily chart yep um i'm not just gonna like step in and buy the pullback you know, I'm going to wait for the 65 minute or the 30 minute to show like supportive action. And then, you know, let's say we get a couple candles like, yep. you know, that are showing support, then I'll buy strength there and I'll, and, you know, and I'll use a stop against that area. Yeah. Um, well, it's a little confirmation. It, it saves you money at the, you know, you might lose a few pennies on the entry, but it gives you confidence that you're doing the correct thing, right? Yeah. And like also the other thing, uh, just on a time frame basis, you know, really kind of when I originally learned, learned to trade, uh -huh. you know, it was like, you know, use the five minute chart and like get a good entry, blah, blah, blah. And it's what I found is, you know, the five minute can cause you to over trade. And, you know, if you step out to like a 30 or a 65 minute chart, you know, you might uh, assuming that you get a perfect price on the five minute, which everybody seems to, uh, right. you know, you might pay a little higher price, but you're going to, you're going to take so many less like false trades. You're, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to just take more actionable trades. So, so I'm, I'm a believer in, uh, you know, you, you don't really need to look below like the, the 30 minute or, or really even the 65, you know, at least for how I trade, obviously sure, everybody sure. has their own niche. Um, hey, you're successful and this is, this is gold for people watching. So, so this is actually the tidbits you're saying people, you know, every, it's going to save a lot of people getting chopped up in the, in the smaller yeah. time. Well, yeah. And look, like I had to get chopped up to learn that. Um, well, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, I lost a lot of money actually <laughs> learning how to do this. Um, and uh, and then so, you know, like I said earlier, spot relative strength by trying to yep. buy stocks that are ahead of the indexes. That's not always 100 percent the case You know, mm -hmm. coming off of a major correction. Like I had a huge trade in this stock Lavongo in, you know, coming out of COVID that uh, it actually was a little bit behind the index, just a touch. But uh -huh. once, it, once it kicked into gear, though, it like it took off. Wow. Um, yeah, wow. So it's not 100 percent, but it's you know, it's it's pretty good. Um, and then there's no excuse to ever chase a name because you can just always wait for that next setup. Um, you can right. always wait for that next pullback, that that next base. Um, so some disadvantages. So like kind of in the world that I learned in, you know, the canceling world, people talk about the 50 day moving average or whatever. Right. Um, so they say my strategy leads to more whipsaw potential, you know, more mm -hmm. whipsaw than an investor. But but, you know, I, I just think it's a strategy and you execute it. So. Right. Right. I'll put an asterisk next to that. Um, and then it's trend following in nature. So in more range bound environments, you know, there's potential for more false signals. I think that the way I trade, especially since I use the price bars to kind of anticipate the, the, the breaking of the moving averages back up, you can make money in, in any market. Um, like I actually think 2022, I, I should have had a huge year. Yeah. Um, kind of what I know now. Um, it's just your, huge year, you know, not relative to a year like this, but, you know, I, I could have had a, a, a very solid year um, in, in that my moving average is my 10 day, my 20 day, you can catch these, you know, two, three, four week rallies. Um, just because of the market, you're not going to have those two to three month rallies, right? So you're going to have right. smaller winners. You're not going to have these huge trends. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to me, that's a positive, but, you know, in theory, depending on who you ask, um, trend followers, you know, can't make money in choppier markets. Um, then discretionary execution, you know, 
this is one I would also say could be viewed as an advantage, you know, uh -huh. once you kind of really put in the work. Um, yep. But yep. it certainly leaves the door open to emotional mistakes. Like, look, I don't I don't care who you talk to. I, I, I think these people who say emotions don't exist in trading, I think that's total BS. My God, they're uh, super, they super exist. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. yeah. You know, I think your emotions are always there. I think with experience, you know, hopefully you can learn to better understand them. Right, um, right. And like, for example, one of the things that I used to always do is when we would have the reversal extension back to the 20 EMA, uh -huh. I, would always, I would always think that, we'd be having a bear flag, <laughs> uh, but now I just kind of know, no, we're in that crazy volatile period where it may break down and look like a bear flag, but it may just rip right back the next day. Like I don't get caught in that anymore. Um, you know, so I kind of understand, you know, by the right. time I really want a short, you know, yep. sometimes it's not worth it. Um, and then it's not complete. So, you know, other tricks like relative strength, I love right. gaps, you know, stocks that have huge gap ups. I love to look for setups in. Right. And I have some other things that probably no one's going to know what they are, but wick plays. I love inside bars. You know, you have a wide range bar, then an inside bar. And then, you know, all that is is a contraction and volatility, really. And then a move higher, you know, support resistance. I, I use candle patterns. Um, you know, on the 30 minute, 65 minute. And really when I'm analyzing dailies, volume to me is, is, is everything, you know, yep. I, when people say volume doesn't work, you know, I just, I don't even try to change their mind. Um, but let me tell you, it, it does. And this um, trading plan, um, Oliver, you came up with it by yourself or is it a combination of smaller things that other people have taught you or how, how, how were you able to create such a comprehensive and professional trading plan? Well, so like, you got to remember, I've been doing this now for like, uh, 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. And I unsuccessfully did it <laughs> for like six years. And, but in that whole time period where I was doing things unsuccessfully, you know, I was learning a lot and right. I was very fortunate, you know, that I, I, I've met guys over the years who I've picked bits and pieces up, um, you know, big gap ups equal the street caught is caught off guard, you know, right. mean, right. mean, you know, that's something I learned from a guy who, you know, just a, just a guy who trades from home who's done very well. Right. And, you know, I've incorporated that into what I do. Um, you know, uh, volume from trader Florida, uh, right. You know, I, I, I've learned so much from so many different people who trade similar but different yep. to me. Um, and then I've just taken those little bits and pieces and I've pulled it into what I do and created my own strategy. Um, so that would actually be my advice to literally anybody out there that's trying yep. to learn to trade is, you know, be a sponge, learn from everybody. Right. Like you're, you're a reversion trader, right? Yep. You know, I'm sure I could learn something from you that would help you me spot you reversal could. extensions or, or whatever it may be, or maybe where I should sell, where you're looking to short, you know, um, and I could incorporate that into improving what I do. Yeah, I would uh, incorporate, for example, watching the VIX also uh, in, in yeah. your trade. Yeah, exactly. So there's, there's so many things that, you know, I've been influenced by a lot of people who've helped me out. Um, you know, I've got a couple, you know, couple select people who I've really learned a lot from who, who I'm very fortunate to yeah. have met. Um, and are you confident now that you can make it in any sorts of market, bear market, choppy market, bull market, anything? Yeah, I think I really am. I think 2022, you know, even though I, I think I could have had a much better year um, yep. coming out of that. I mean, look, I traded 18 which people try to say 18 was a bear market. Like 18 was not a bear market. It was this big sell off. COVID was about the furthest thing ever from a bear market. I mean, it was right. just a month long sell off. You got out of the way and you just got back in and everything. Three went. weeks, March yeah, 23rd. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And now, you know, 2022 was definitely a legitimate three wave, you know, year and a half, two year bear market. And in reality, even though the indexes didn't start the 
bear market technically until 2022. The right. bear market started in February of 21, in my eyes, for the names that I trade, you know, the more right. high in growth, which is right. part of the reason why I think, you know, I had a huge January, February of 2021 because we were having a blow off top yeah. in a lot of these yeah. names. Yeah. And and then I was kind of a beta trader the rest of the way because I was I had some big trades and some names like NVIDIA, AMD, Tesla that were more larger caps that were still going up. But right. then I had more losses in, in some of these other names that would like look like they were setting up, but then they'd shake out and I'd take a loss. And I think right. that was part of the reason why. Well, no, don't think. I mean, I know from going back and looking at my sure. trade, you know, that was why I, you know, didn't do as well in or you know whatever the last you know nine months of that year um yeah you know for me 2022 is the golden year because it's the yeah. dream year but you know so it's it's yeah. great I, I have to learn from you because you know i i am not a very good momentum trader so yeah. and and it's hard for a contra you know uh, like a someone who fades the moves to to incorporate some momentum trades into the the move so if, if you were training me, how, how could I incorporate a, some of what you're doing into my trading? I mean, so like we talked about this the other day, I, I, a lot of people say like, you should have different strategies to diversify. I actually think that you should just get better at doing what it is that you really do. And, yep. you know, sometimes the market's not going to, marry up with what you do so I, I was given some really good advice by by you know an, an older trader who basically said you know the best traders in the world and this guy's experience and he he right. he'd seen a lot of traders he actually ran a prop desk the guy i'm talking about he said you know they they either step aside in markets that don't favor them so for you if it's like a runaway momentum market maybe you just say uh you know We'll we'll let this one go and we'll. You know we'll that's funny. Yeah. I have yeah. you know what I have nothing on right now, nothing, because this market is just. I know it's just gonna kill me if I start trading. It. Well, yeah, but you're not losing anything at all. No, like no, no. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I have it in treasuries and you know whatever. Yeah, yeah and you're and more importantly, like you're preserving all your mental capital and you're definitely. gonna come in when things set back up for you, which they definitely will. Like the market will set up just how you want it to eventually, right? Right, right. Sooner, you know, yeah. yeah. And then uh, he said, or, or you know, they, they're able to kind of jump into a different mode. Um, and he was like, you know, those guys are obviously like the very best. <laughs> right. But he said, you know, the risk in jumping into a different mode is you have to know when to back get back into your main mode. Definitely, definitely. So, you know, um what I, what I do is I trade a little, you know, instead of trading my normal size, I just put a little bit in just to get back in, into the flow of things, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, you, yeah, recognize. And, and then, you know what, if you kind of get slapped on the hand, you, you, you get it's out fine. again. Or if yeah. it starts working, you say, okay, things might be coming back yeah. more my way. Um, right. I'm, I'm married. I'm used to getting slapped, so I'm fine. I'm <laughs> hey, you and me both. You and me both. So, um, you know, Oliver, you, if there's something else we want to share, because I think people are going to be nuts uh, trying to contact you, trying to learn from you. I wanted to ask you something. How long do you think it will take a person to not to be like you, but to be proficient yeah. enough to, to survive? I mean, it, you know, every person like it took me really in reality, even though I kind of made and lost money, it took me like six years, six um, years. Well, wow. whereas like I have a guy who I, you know, I sort of helped learn or I, I view it like he he learned himself. I I just was an influencer for him. Um, but he, you know, made good money in 2020. I think I think he made money in 21. He got destroyed in 2022. And then he but he, but he but he studied and he realized right. like, shoot, like, you know, I really don't know what I'm doing. And I mean, and I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know, but I think I'm pretty confident that this guy is is proficient now in, in 2023, um, just with the way he's analyzing the market and more importantly, the way he's kind of like making his own decisions. Like, I do think that you have to make your own decisions. You know, you can get ideas from somebody else, 
but you kind of have to own the idea. You know, if you get the idea, put it in your charting software, right. analyze it yourself, decide where you're going to get in, where you're going to get out, how you're going to size it, you know, why you're going to do what you're going to do. Right. Um, and I think until you do that and start to kind of own your trading and you're in, you know, the actual ideas you're going to trade, it's tough to get better. But once you do that, assuming that you are going to analyze your trades, because I think that's a big thing is yeah. studying what you did right and what you did wrong. Um, you know, you know, for for young traders that you're like 2022, it's invaluable because you young yeah. people have never seen a bad year, right? I've never seen it. Bear, like I was saying, I'd be I'd, I'd avoided every other correction. You every you correction. needed to have this year for your learning, for your for for your learning experience. And you know something? It wasn't that bad. It could have been worse, but it was a yeah. good learning experience for young people like you. You know, yeah, it was huge for me. Like it was huge. It was what I needed, I think, to, to hopefully yeah. complete everything for, for me. And I've right. talked to some guys, you know, guys might, you know, my dad's 75 and, you know, he's been trading for 45, right. 47 years. And he's like, you know, I've been through like eight Every or nine day. cycles. Yep. You know, this is like really your first actual cycle. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, like it's, uh, yeah, uh, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm almost looking forward to the next one. Not not really, but I'm I'm uh, you know I'm I'm, I'm ready for the challenge. Would you tell us a little bit about the swing report, Oliver? I'm you yeah. know I've been watching your site. It's very exciting, and it's I think it's a way of you uh, giving back and you know sharing your wisdom. Yeah. So basically, I mean, I, I wrote a book that basically just goes through 2020 the trades I took, and it goes through this strategy. Um, and then now I write a newsletter called The Swing Report, where basically I just kind of, you know, how I see the market, the stocks I'm interested in, um, how I'm trading them. You know, that's basically it. You know, I'm not always right, obviously. And if no I'm one is, no one is. Uh, but, you know, it's 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 what I think is going to happen in the market. And these are, you know, it's almost like my journal. It's like what I'm doing. Um, and then I did do this master class with these guys, Trader Line, and it's right. on their website. And I, I would say I, that I've just like, it. it's great. It's absolutely great. You went through, you know, every single thing that you do. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's it's pretty long. Like it's I, I it's watched long. the whole thing. Yeah. I watched the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm it's, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm that type of person that goes deep into the rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's great. I mean, it's very in depth and, and actually, you know, now I, I feel like there's more, I could have talked about more of the price structure type stuff. Right. Um, but you know, you just kind of overlook things, you know, just cause uh, like I said, you know, you do this so long and there's things that you just like, don't even think of that are, that are so important. Um, so the swing report is like, you know, sort of literally how I'm thinking about the market day in and day out. And, you know, as things come up, you just get to see how I'm thinking about it. And yep. again, you know, sometimes I'm thinking something that is not right, <laughs> um, but you know, you see how I handle that, which is, uh, you know, half the battle in trading too. And Oliver, you know, I'm fascinated because, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of personal finance. Let's yeah. say to end the, to end the podcast, could you tell us, let's say you started with a dollar and you finished the year with three, $4. How much of that money would you, put away and into, you know, real estate, Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> what I, I don't know, whatever you, you know, yeah. the S and P 500 or, and is there a size that you're comfortable that you're, you, you don't want to increase your size. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, how many units uh, you want to start the year, finish the year and put away? Sure. So, you know, one thing for me is that I do, you know, my wife works and everything. So, right. Really, when we're thinking about that, we're looking at like the complete picture, right? Okay. Um, and so for me, you know, the main thing is like I want to have definitely just all our expenses for the year. Okay. Like, no problem. Um, and, you know, so for example, like I have a kid, another kid on the way, you know, I bought a bigger house, mortgage is bigger. So like all that stuff, like I don't want to have to be worried about that at all. Well, and I don't so, want to scare you. So I had 
three years ago, I had three going to college simultaneously. Yeah. And whatever they tell you, I was paying with everything, 120 per kid. So imagine yeah. 360,000 a year tax yeah. free. So, well, yeah. so, and, so get and ready, so, start, you know, I, I would start polishing my skills a little bit more. <laughs> well, yeah. So, you know, we're maxing out the five, two, nine, exactly. all that stuff. And then, yeah. uh, I actually like, I know this is probably something that, you know, most financial advisors say not to do or whatever, but, but I actually like, I, I, I have some whole life insurance policies and, and literally well, no, you the, should. you're smart. Yeah. I, I'm a hundred percent for the, one of the best decisions I've made in of my life is to get the huge like life insurance whole life. But when I was young, like you. So like literally my, uh, my kid, I bought my kid a policy when he was like three months old. Right. Um, right. It's not it's, huge, but like, yeah. I don't, you know, I don't even notice the money coming out of my account. It could pay for his college if he wanted mm -hmm. to use the cash value for that. Right. And right. So I actually view it. If I build up the cash value, that's kind of like insurance for me. That's my, you know, people say you should have an emergency fund, like, right. My right. emergency fund is my cash value. And so, so that's, that's you know, smart. What smart. I do there. yeah. And then I, I wouldn't say I have a set number on the real estate. So, my wife and I used to be like more active in real estate here. I live in Philly. We used to kind of renovate yep. houses and stuff here. Um, and so we have some good cash flow coming out of that. We mostly just reinvest that because we don't, we don't actually like need the money. Mm -hmm. um, but then my older brother does real estate full time. Um, and sort of like when he has deals come up, like we'll put money in his Ooh. deals. And so, you know, we kind of just base that on, you know, when he has something right. good, you know, we'll put money in it. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know. That, like, actually, I would say like last year or, you know, as rates have gone up, like we haven't put money in any any mm -hmm. deals or like he just hasn't had as much mm -hmm. going on. Um, but the nice thing about that, even versus like when we were doing real estate ourselves, the nice thing is you kind of have control over it. So you kind of know exactly how much, you know, money right. you got every month. Mm -hmm. But you know you're getting the calls, right? And uh, I don't so mind. now, yeah. Well, like even when you have a property manager, you're managing the manager. Matter, I mean, every business has problems. There's yeah, there's yeah, not yeah. a problem-free business. So but when, you I know, put maybe a brother, when I put the money with my brother, though, yeah, like I, I'm just like I'm like a whole nother uh, <laughs> step removed, you know. And sort of is what we realized is, you know, he he takes a cut off the top for sure, right? Uh, but you know, we realized he, he's just so good at it that even though he takes a cut off the top, You're still he making. makes a lot of that up for it, just being real good at it. Um, and you know, I can kind of stay focused on what I'm doing. Right. And, uh, you know, for me, that's the key. Like, I don't want to be stressed out about something stupid, no, no, but in no. reality, you know, you can get stressed out with like things that like have basically zero financial impact on you relative right. to your main thing but it can affect your main thing and i it try to of, do my best to you know not let that interfere with my trading you know maybe have enough rental income from your real estate to cover your um your yearly expenses that would take a lot of pressure off of things right well yeah yeah that that would be ideal that would be ideal um and you will get there pretty soon pretty yeah soon. i think we'll be we'll actually we'll be there pretty soon i think um, yeah. like actually we reinvest a lot of our money in the real estate side of things. I'd be curious if we didn't do that. I think we'd still be a little bit short, but you know, we'd be, we'd be, you know, getting there. Now, has it been hard for you to increase your, uh, trading capital every year? I mean, learning how to trade a bigger amount, is that, is that hard every year or, or yeah. A, a, a little bit. So like, I think uh, that was the other thing is that, uh, you know, I basically increased my account tenfold. And then, you know, I wow. basically, basically another month later, I, you know, I more than doubled it again. And wow. it was like insane. And then obviously I had to pay like a lot of taxes, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, which, uh, which, you know, I, I definitely had an adjustment there. And I would say, you know, the big thing really is you don't you don't notice the difference in the size of your capital until you have your kind of first drawdown. And, then, and then Definitely. you realize like, oh, man, I'm trading a lot more money because I'm losing a lot more. 
when everything is going well, it's not a, it's not a, an issue, at least for me, it's not, it's just like the same old, same old, but kind of once you get punched in the mouth is, is then you realize like, all right, like I really got to tighten things up. You know, this is what we're trading now, Like these are the swings yep. it just is what it is for me, for me mentally, uh, you know, like I used to make about like 200 K in a, in a, in a year. And, uh, you know, in 2022, I, I had a day where I was down, like, I don't know, like 300 grand or something. Oh my God. Sure. And I mean, I almost like shit myself. Of course. Of course. <laughs> like, I think that, that, that 200 number is like a number that like really affects me mentally, Of course. Oh, which I think I'm definitely getting through that though. Um, and now it's just uh, like, I think for me when I'm trading well, it, it's not really about the, the money or, or anything. It's more, you know, what are the price bars doing? Right. You know, did we expand? Did we then have like a, you know, a contraction properly? Like, I don't know how to describe it. You know, you're saying. talking as a winner. Winners focus on the process. The result exactly. will take care of itself. So now I'm confident more than ever that you're gonna do this correctly for the rest of your life. You you talk, every person that I've talked to who's done this successfully talks like you with a different strategy, with a different mindset, but sure. you're focusing on your process, on your rules, on, yeah. on you know, on being uh, very disciplined. And that that's going to make you successful, Oliver. So Yeah, that's really what it is. And it's easy to get thrown off your process. Yes. Uh, but the more you just kind of hammer your process and you really own it, like yep. me, I'm not looking to anybody else for guidance anymore. Like right. I'm not looking right. to any, and I know right now because the market's ripping. I know there's other people buying stocks that are going up more than my stocks or, or whatever. You know, I've had some pretty nice winners recently, but you know, there's certainly guys that have had better trades. Uh, but like, I'm gonna get these trades, and then I'm confident. You know, the next run or, or when it's time to sell. You know, I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to be getting out and I'm going to keep my account moving. You know, that's really what I'm focused yep. on. And, and you know, yep. hopefully I hopefully I get the best trades along the way. But oh, I want to no get deal. trades and then I want to kind of keep it moving, if that makes any you know, sense. You know, I would you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not your teacher. I would love to teach you how to incorporate derivatives to to, yeah. to set stops, to to take profits, to take risk off the table. You're so yeah. smart. There are some little things you could do with derivatives that will just uh, forget. I don't think enhance your results, but it will help you take a risk off the table and keeping the same risk on. So yeah. I think, believe it or not, you're still young. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you could add little by little in your in your trading plan that make, to make you a better a better player. You know. Yeah, no, I mean, I could definitely learn a lot. I mean, I even, we talked the other day yep. going back to synthetic long and, yep. um, you know, I know there's things I could do, uh, you know, like when a stock goes on a big move, like, you know, sell some in the money calls, you know, to, to maybe extend the life of that, that right. trade tactic. Right. Yeah. That. There's a little but, tweet. You know, for, for me right now, with where I'm no, at. No, right now, right yeah. now, I wouldn't change it. But when you no, start bet, getting old know. like me, you get less hair, you get start getting gray <laughs> hair. Maybe, maybe you're gonna say, Hey, Tony, hey, let me help help me put this thing together. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, like right now I'm just trying to like like every every so like I mean, we we talked about how there's like market cycles, right? And right. this was the first like major cycle I've been through with a bear. But you know, for me, there's generally like, you know, two to three cycles per year like two to three good right. runs a year and i think like each run you know i i get better you get better right? working my strategy um and so you know one of the things i do that actually you, you talked about you know people learning is after each run so like for example this run started november 1st right let's just say it runs to mid-january you know i have no idea probably let's, like let's just yeah. say that yeah for uh, sure you know, at the end of that run is what I'll do is I will, you know, I'll go through my best trades, you know, so CrowdStrike, Coin have been two really good trades for me. Right. And right. I will mark up, you know, where the proper entries were, where the exits were. Um, 
and I have a OneNote file. So OneNote, it's like Microsoft Word. Yep, so yep, yep, yep. And yep. I go in that and I'll make a tab, you know, of, uh, you know, 2023. And throughout the whole year, I'm putting down, you know, and, and like, look, there's, there's, there's great trades, but then there's trades that I know, like I actually would be in, you know, the stock is a stock I would trade, things like that. And I'm trying to put all those in that file. And then is what I'll do is I'll also go through and I'll identify, you know, the two to three, hopefully not more than that, you know, names that I know I should have been in that I wasn't in. And I'll try to identify, you know, hey, you know, what should have tipped me off that I that I should have been paying attention to this name? You know, where was the proper entry? The same process. And I'll put that in the file and I do that every run. And uh, so by the end of the year, you know, maybe I've gone through, you know, 60 to 80, you know, trades. Right. Um, right. And every time you do that, you know, subconsciously, it helps you be better at identifying the, the triggers, you know, yeah. for the next run. You know who uh, does that and did it successfully for all his career? Career uh, guy Bill Belichick. He, he, yeah, you know, he analyzes the, the you know, the footage. Uh, he teaches his students, his, his his warriors. In your case, your warriors are your stocks and and your brain. Exactly. So you 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 every everything you say, it's uh, it's. I love talking to, you know, I don't want to pump you up too much, but I love talking <laughs> to a genius. Uh, well, really, yeah. now, you're, now so you're, young guy. No, no, you're such a young guy, and <laughs> and you're you're talking like a, a guy who has been trading for a long time, and I really applaud you. And keep keep that humility, keep yeah. that uh, curiosity to learn and improve. I think it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna make you a, a huge success, Oliver. And you know, we've been doing this now an hour and a half. I can't thank you enough. And I don't know if there's something else you want to share with uh, the my my trader addicts that watch our show. And uh, and no, I, can't not really. I mean, you guys kind of know about me at this point. And uh, you know, for anybody out there, just work hard and study. Get a strategy if you don't have one, and look to refine it and, and get better at it. Thank you, Oliver. And everybody, let's thank Oliver uh, for coming into the podcast. And uh, if you want to grow your pile like Oliver, follow Oliver, the Swing Report, and also follow Uncle Tony. And remember, you got to risk it to get the biscuit, baby. No, no risk it, no biscuit. <laughs> exactly. I love that. Wow. Wow.